Welcome back to this special edition of Hannity. Anti-Trump FBI agent Peter Strzok has been subpoenaed to testify before a public joint hearing of the House Judiciary and Oversight Committees next Tuesday. But according to Strzok's attorney, Peter Strzok may not comply with the subpoena. Watch this. Will your client comply with the subpoena or the request? Will he come on in and do another interview? My client will testify publicly soon, somewhere, sometime. Uh, we just got this subpoena today, so I don't know whether or not we are going to be testifying next Tuesday in front of these two particular House subcommittees. Why isn't uh, it an automatic yes, Eitan? Because we have come to the conclusion, we've been forced to come to the conclusion that this is not a search for truth. It is a chance for Republican members of the House to preen and posture before their most radical, conspiracy-minded constituents. Joining me now with reaction is House Oversight Chairman, South Carolina Congressman Trey Gowdy. He's the author of a book with the Senator Tim Scott called Unified. And Trey, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Yes, sir. Um, uh, conspiracy theories he was talking about that we, that Republicans, to, you know, buy into this stuff. But I want to play a clip from Adam Schiff talking that you were one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. So play this clip here. Sadly, here we have all too many members of Congress willing to prostrate themselves before the executive and give him anything he wants. You want to name names uh, which members of Congress are in this cult-like uh, group that, you, uh, that you're uh, suggesting? Well, you know, the, the four horsemen of this apocalypse uh, have been uh, Devin Nunes and Trey Gowdy, uh, Mark Meadows and Jim Jordan. They have been leading the charge basically to require the Justice Department to give them materials that can be leaked or fed or misrepresented like the infamous Nunes memorandum in the service of the president. Interesting comments from Mr. Schiff. Um, Mr. Gowdy, how many times have you met and interacted uh, with Donald Trump? I have never met President Trump, never had a conversation with him. I, I do want to get to Strzok and Page in a second, but, but Jason, initially I took that as a compliment. I'm a huge Ric Flair fan, so anytime somebody says you're part of the Four Horsemen, I thought it was a compliment. <laughs> It was my wife who later said, I think he's talking about those four guys from the book of Revelation. So that's not a compliment. Let me tell you this about Adam. Adam's had a terrible last couple of years. He wanted to be the attorney general under Hillary Clinton, and no one in the country worked harder to protect her than Adam Schiff. He wanted to be the head of the CIA. He wanted to run for California and run for Senate in the People's Republic of California. But he couldn't win either of those seats. So now, now he wants to be the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, speaking of the apocalypse, Adam Schiff wants to be the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee. If you ever have, I don't know, a couple of free months with nothing else to do, I want you to go back, Jason, and think of all the things you would not know if you had taken Adam Schiff's advice. You wouldn't know the whole the spontaneous reaction to a video was a hoax in Libya. You would never have read the first Chris Stevens email. You wouldn't know that Hillary Clinton had this unique email arrangement with herself because Adam Schiff did everything in his power to keep you from finding out. You wouldn't know about the dossier. You wouldn't know who funded it. You wouldn't know it was used in a court proceeding. You wouldn't know about Strzok and Page. In fact, you wouldn't even be having a show tonight. You wouldn't be having a show about Strzok and Page if Adam Schiff had had his way. So, Look, if they secede from the union and President Maxine Waters wants to make him the attorney general in California, more power to him. Otherwise, I don't think anybody on my side of the aisle gives much of a damn what Adam Schiff thinks. Well, he certainly gets out there and says it a lot, whatever it is he's saying, but he has, I think, misled and misused that position uh, from my own personal vantage point time and time again. Now, coming before you, though, is this uh, Peter Strzok. As I recall, he originally said he would voluntarily uh, testify, that he wanted to get out and tell his story, but then you heard his attorney in that clip say that he may not show up. Well, I'm certainly sorry if anyone hurt his feelings last week uh, during the 13 hours we spent. But, but the only thing I did was go over what he had written. Um, so if he's offended, he's offended with things that he wrote. Uh, he wrote a lot of texts. There are emails. It's an unprecedented level of animus. So, of course, he's going to be asked, what did you mean? I can't use all of the words on a family-friendly show like yours, but what did you mean by blanking abysmal? What did you mean by blanking this? I, I, we went through all of his texts. 
Here, here's what's important, Jason. He's supposed to be investigating Hillary Clinton for potential violations of the Espionage Act. In March of 2016, when he's supposed to be investigating her, he hadn't even interviewed her yet. He thinks that she should win the presidency 100 million to zero. Jason, she wasn't even the nominee at the time. They didn't even have a Republican nominee at the time. But she's going to win 100 million to zero in March of 2016, and this according to the guy who's supposed to be dispassionately and objectively interviewing her. Then in July, when the Russia probe started, he is saying terrible things about the very person he's supposed to be objectively investigating. And then we get to the Mueller probe. You know, I mean, he's been on all three, Hillary Clinton, Russia probe, Mueller probe, until they found this text. He's talking about impeachment even before the House Democrats and MSNBC were talking about impeachment. He hadn't been on the case three days before he's already talking about impeaching the president. So, of course, we're going to have a lot of questions for him, and some of them might actually be uncomfortable. But he's going to come before a public hearing, whether his lawyer thinks he is or not. He's coming. I'm sure he would rather go in front of Adam Schiff. That, that's what I read. He'd rather go in front of Adam Schiff. They got a lot in common. They both wanted Hillary Clinton to be president. I get why he wants to go there. But he's going to come before our two committees, whether he wants to or not. Well, uh, you know, look, it, Peter Strzok did not have an insignificant job. As like, I like to say, he didn't work for the Fish and Wildlife Department. He was the number two person in counterintelligence for the United States uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation. They have tens of thousands of people to choose from. Have you been able to find out why is it that he was selected or appointed to go be on the Mueller probe? Um, well, you got to go all the way back to Clinton. He was on the Clinton probe. And then in July, not only was he on the Russia probe pre Mueller, he was the lead agent on the Russia probe pre Mueller. So in July of 2016, we'd just gotten through Jim Comey with that unprecedented press conference. And three weeks later, he's working on Donald Trump's campaign and the Russia probe. I think that group was then transposed over onto the Russia probe, and then they, many of them were transposed over onto the Mueller probe. I will give Mueller credit for this. The moment he found out about these texts, he got rid of Peter Strzok. But here's what you ought to be asking yourself. If it was bad enough for Bob Mueller to get rid of him, the moment he found out about the text, these texts weren't written in March of 2017. They were written in March of 2016. So he never should have been on any of these three probes. If the animus was enough to kick him off when you found it, the animus should have been enough to kick him off when he said it, which was early in 2016. Completely the wrong person. The FBI's reputation, look, there are lots and lots of fantastic FBI agents, 99.9% .9 of them. But to pick this person, and not just him, Lisa Page and other heretofore not identified FBI agents, you remember when Jim Comey, I think you were in the committee room, when Jim yeah. Comey said the FBI didn't give a hoot about politics? Yeah. Go read these texts. They gave a lot more than a hoot about who was going to be the Democrat nominee and whether Donald Trump would win. Well, real quickly, because I only got a few seconds, Lisa Page was on the other end of those texts. What's going to happen with her? She's coming, too. I mean, I heard your guests that were on before me, Jason. I just disagree with them. I think any time you have a chance to spend 12 hours with a witness, you ought to spend it. I get five minutes with Peter Strzok in a public hearing. Yeah. I got 10 hours with him last week. So we're going to interview her, and then I hope we have a public hearing with her. But it's more important to me that all these questions get asked on the record. Talk about, I mean, if you want a serious investigation, pick the 10 hours over the five minutes is what I would tell my fellow citizens. Yes, and they need to get the documents from the Department of Justice. Trey Gowdy, thank Amen. you so much for joining us tonight. I, I want to get to you, particularly as it relates to Peter Strzok. Uh, you have done, I can tell you, as the former chairman of the Oversight Committee, nobody was rooting more for Judicial Watch than me because you were amazing in being able to extract documents out of the Department of Justice, and they're still stonewalling. But as we go into this Peter Strzok hearing, what is it that you would like to see, and what documents do you still need to see at Judicial Watch? Well, it's hard to question someone when you don't have all the documents, and Congress still doesn't have all the text messages, all the emails. Yeah. Uh, the government told us they want to take up to two years to turn over the communications between Page and Strzok. In fact, they just gave us a batch of emails, and as best as I can tell, you know, those are the first publicly available emails we have between Page and Strzok. They don't talk about Russiagate yet. 
uh, but at least the process has begun, which is better than what Congress is uh, facing with the Justice Department, where they haven't committed to providing any information. And Mr. Strzok himself hasn't committed necessarily to testifying on the Hill. On Tuesday, uh, his lawyer is, uh, you know, arguing about whether he's going to testify or not. So, uh, you know, Congress has got to decide to fish or cut bait on this and to continually threaten the administration or members of the administration with impeachment and contempt and not follow through uh, doesn't seem to be getting them anywhere. And they need to escalate it uh, either by bringing the president in directly or coming up with other ways to force justice's hand in producing these records that Congress has a right to see under the Constitution and the law. The Justice Department is thumbing its nose at Congress. It's thumbing its nose at the presidency. And there's a real crisis here. And the document fight is just one symptom of it. And it's all designed to protect this in terrible corruption that took place during the Obama administration. And it's continued into the Trump administration through the compromised Mueller investigation. Yeah, you know, people talk about the deep state. But I can tell you, uh, when I went there, I didn't know much about it. But now. It, I found that it's very real. In fact, I'm writing a book about it. It's coming out in September. Uh, but David, I want to go back to you. What is it that Congress could and should do in order to extract those documents? And what would you ask Peter Strzok when he appears, as he's supposed to, under subpoena on Tuesday? Well, there's a whole set of questions, of course, that have to be asked. I, I think it's playing out like a circus now with his lawyer. His lawyer first was boasting that Strzok, of course, wants to testify publicly. He's been a victim. He wants to clear his name. He's going to have to eat those emails. Now they allowed him to appear behind closed doors, which I thought was a mistake. They, there's no reason to license him to do that. They have the right. upper hand. And now the lawyer is saying, well, it's a setup. Uh, what did they think? He was, they weren't going to ask him about the emails? We need to know about that meeting in McCabe's office that Strzok says happened with Strzok, McCabe, Page, with the agenda of stop Trump. But I just want to back up one second. What Tom Fitton and Judicial Watch is doing is tremendously important, and it's a great service to the country. Those documents thereafter, including Andrew Weissman's emails, now that we saw the emails from Strzok, let's see what the people who we know they have an agenda on the Mueller team, let's see what their email said. He's after those emails. We're after the FISA applications. Documents are power. This is a vitally important source. Need transparency. The American people should all demand them. And Congress is doing a great service the, to the greatest degree that they demand these documents and answers from Peter Strzok. But don't stop with Peter Strzok. The risk is here making Peter Strzok the bad guy so that he's just a bad apple. It's a culture that he represents. Because remember, no one told him to stop doing this at the Justice Department, what he was doing. It's a culture. Yeah, good, good point. Kaylee, uh, the you. president took the spotlight of the country to, to Great Falls, Montana. Uh, he's now traveling back across the country uh, where he will announce the Supreme Court pick uh, at 9 o'clock on Monday night. Then you have the Peter Strzok that's gonna, uh, a hearing that's happening on Tuesday. And we see people climbing the Statue of Liberty and talking about the, the resistance movement. You've been watching this up close and personal. Contrast what's happening with the Republicans and the message and what Donald Trump is doing versus the flailing that we see from the Democrats. Yeah, it's, it's quite a contrast. You know, over at the Republican Party, we celebrate these achievements that are happening every day. And, you know, let's put this into context, the Supreme Court nomination. You know, put aside the economy that's roaring, hitting historic heights. Put aside the historic North Korean summit. Put aside all of the great things this president has done. Uh, this nomination alone will make this presidency one of the most consequential in modern history, changing the balance on the Supreme Court. We are celebrating over at the Republican Party because it's that phrase that I love so much that Reagan used, it's morning in America again. And while we're celebrating this positive achievement record that's happening daily, Democrats are going farther and farther left. I mean, it's incredible the state of the Democratic Party when you're embracing socialism, when DNC Chair Tom Perez said Ocasio-Cortez and socialism are the new face of our party. That is a striking moment that our Democratic counterparts not only are calling for basically violent harassment, but now embracing socialism. Socialism, which has failed across the world. Tom, do you ever get any support there at Judicial Watch uh, from members of the Democratic Party? I mean, do they? You would think the Democratic Party of the old was the one that wanted openness and transparency, but do they ever come to help you and support Judicial Watch's call for document transparency? 
you know, there are some Democrats, and you know this from the Hill, that do like FOIA. They like the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, they especially like it now that uh, President Trump is in office and they're using it to investigate uh, his administration. You know, but frankly, we've sued the Trump administration more than anyone else in the city uh, for documents under FOIA. Uh, look, I, I think the big problem for Democrats and liberals generally is there's this uh, pro-violence virus percolating among its supporters and some of its elected officials like Maxine Waters, who needs to be ethically censured or even expelled by the House for inciting violence against the Trump cabinet. Uh, you know, they're going to lose the Supreme Court nomination as surely as night follows day, and their members and supporters are going to get support, are, are going to be frustrated. And it's up to the leadership of the Democratic Party and liberal leaders uh, to, to say, we don't want violence. We don't want you attacking law enforcement. We don't want you breaking the law. And we don't want you attacking government officials who are serving in the Trump administration. And if you're an elected official who does it, we're going to drum you out, not only the House, but potentially the Senate, if you do these things. David, uh, I, I want to ask th you. That's the problem they're facing politically. David, I want to ask you real quickly of just a moment. But Maxine Waters and what she said uh, away from the Capitol, where she is protected by advice and uh, the speech and debate clause, have you seen her step over the line? Has she done anything that's illegal? I don't know about illegal. She stepped over the line as a matter of judgment, and she's doing a great disservice. I know she's very passionate about what she's saying. There's absolutely no place in the public discourse for threats and that kind of conduct from a public official. There's no place for it. Well, I, I, I agree with you. It's, uh, life is tough enough. I can tell you the members of Congress on both sides of the aisle, uh, it's tough to be away from your family, and it's tough to take the public criticism. They're there. They signed up for it. they got to be tough. But to have another member inciting that uh, just steps over the line. I thank you very much, the three of you. Uh, but please stay at home with us, because coming up, Oversight Committee Chairman Trey Gowdy is here next to discuss anti-Trump FBI agent Peter Strzok's public testimony on Capitol Hill, scheduled for Tuesday, as this special edition of Hannity continues.